Yo, what's up guys? Bill here, Classic Rock and Metal Review. Time for our monthly All Black Sabbath episode. Yeah, I shoot for the 13th of the month. As you can see, a little behind. Once again. But, you know what man? Hold on to your hat on this one. Uh, lots to talk about. You know, rather than just pick one topic, like I have in the past, one certain episode centered around something or other, I'm just going to jam all my Black Sabbath related news, things that just crossed my plate, Sabbath related, all in one episode. I got a couple of CDs I picked up in the last month, Sabbath related directly. Uh, got that Sabbath cocktail recipe to share with you. What's been in the news lately is about a Black Sabbath inspired ballet that's happening later this year. We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll do Top 6 Rarities Volume 5. For 19, we're going to cover 1973, so obviously some live in the UK slash live at last action there for the most part. And some small little news items. I mean, one that was pretty recently in the news, I, I had heard the story, got a little more details about it, which got me to thinking about a few other things. So we'll quickly scoop through those. And pre-recorded a few days ago, yes, but did Bark at the Moon outtakes double CD review. We're going to jam all this shit down your throat right now. So hang on. I suggest a drink and not just guys I got something cool. I already told you what it was going to be. That being Allagash. I've had their beer before. I don't really recall, but this one caught my eye, you know, something to inspired by this episode. Let's get something dark. This is a dark owl, which I'm not normally a fan of, but for the sake of the show, Expand my horizons a little bit, you know, which the show's actually done for me with some of your music recommendations, peeps. Uh, Hoppy Dark Ale. So let's try it. It's got 6.66 alcohol by volume. I'm going to pop this open right now. I haven't tried it before. just bought this single can. But, ah, man, this just happened to come in. Uh, got this made up, you know, just the one. But, uh, and a little, you know, I had room for text down the bottom on the one side. So, uh and you know this wasn't like premeditated or anything I had to come up with a slogan so I watched just happened to watch a couple of the older episodes and noticed I always kind of said that so that's what it's going in let's all salute and toast to the best band ever don't even have to say who they are see if I can get this pour right this time and not all over the desk keyboard etc Oh man, there you are. There we are. Or at the very least, there I am. Let's do it. Oh man, it's a little heavy handed again, some bitch. Because I'm dying of thirst. Can't clear my throat today. All right, well, this will clear, clear everyone's asshole out. First of all, Black Sabbath cocktail recipe. I came across this randomly online a few weeks ago. Actually, found two of them. So, two variations. I'm, I'm just throwing this out there, if anyone's interested, for next month we're going to do a whole Live Evil Deluxe Edition episode, review all four of those discs. And the first one I found, like I said, it's called Black Sabbath. Scotch whiskey is the main ingredient of both of these guys. But the first one uses something called Averna Amaro. I guess that, I think that's like some Italian wine kind of thing. Also absinthe and orange bitters cool it down a little bit I suppose now I don't know if I'm gonna go for that one that sounds pretty awesome though but uh, you're gonna to have to spend a few bucks to put that one together uh, the one I think I'll try will be the scotch whiskey passion fruit syrup you can throw some passion fruit and blackberries in there for, uh, which you, you sort of like model them up that becomes part of the drink then crushed ice and garnish with rose petals on a skewer kind of really looks cool I mean they both look super cool and both look super Sabbath you know me I'm going to try one of them. I don't know. I haven't tried it either, like I said, but like by June 13th, we'll try to do our live evil review. Maybe a few of you will want to toast with your first try at Black Sabbath. I mean, I can't think of any other way to better to salute Black Sabbath than with a nice cold Black Sabbath, right? All right, guys, in the news, I don't know if you caught any of this. I just happened to come across it a few days ago, but it, it's really only pretty recently, a few weeks ago. Iomi recently attended, attended a launch event uh, for a Birmingham Royal Ballet 
production that's centered around the music of and the band Black Sabbath. And they're, you know, the music will be part of the production. So really, I mean, I don't know what you guys think about it. I'll, I'll give you my thoughts on it. But a little more info. The rehearsals already have started. It's supposed to play for one week. You know, there's only a one week run, I think, initially up for sale. I think it's already tickets are for sale. And they're expected to add more dates afterwards. Eight classic Sabbath songs will be part of the show. And some new orchestrations also. Uh, Black Sabbath inspired. And hopefully, I think, I am, we might even be involved in that. The, uh, the guy who's in charge of this, uh, the director of the ballet, Carlos Acosta, he wants as much of the band's involvement as possible, which is really, you know, pretty cool. Now, guys, I'm going to tell you, I, wasn't, I was never at a ballet until about ten, eight or ten years ago. Took my wife, she was into it. Uh, I was really impressed, you know. I mean, first of all, what these ballerinas can do is really physically impressive. But I had, you know, me being the rock metal dude that I am and was, especially at that point, I had no idea there was a live symphony orchestra playing the music for this thing. I also didn't realize that certain plays, newer ones, I guess, especially, they have music written for that specific, you know, production. So what that's what's going to be happening here. They're going to be using... Eight of the songs will be old Sabbath songs, done with an orchestra, by an orchestra live, and they're also gonna come up with some new material that, like, I think, I'm not even 100% sure on the details. It sounds like they might be using some unused songs, or maybe Iomi's gonna help them write songs. It's a little clear, but they're saying unreleased material. At least two of songs will be included in the production, previously unreleased stuff. So I don't know if it's just stuff I only started, never finished. Who knows when he wrote it? Like, who knows what year it was written and stuff like that. But like I said, the director really wants the band fully involved. He's talking about doing like some video footage up on the screen between songs, maybe interview clips, some old stuff, but some new stuff too. This might get really cool. I'm going to tell you, you know, back in maybe like the 80s when I had this Floyd anthology compilation. Now, they, they worked with a ballet in the early 70s. Only a handful of performances. So back in the day, I only saw a few short clips. You know, I had no idea until the early years came out. And I got that early years from, I'm not sure if it's the 71 or 72 box. And that has longer clips of the ballet. Now, Floyd actually performed on stage in front of the ballet or behind the ballet. But what was cool about it was that the moves and the choreography was done to go with the music. It wasn't just the bands just jamming and the ballet's just doing whatever the hell they feel like. So in my opinion, this is a really cool thing. It's not coming to the US or no plans for that yet. Just in Birmingham, I wish I could get over there. Uh, I would totally be into this. I mean, why not? Bands done touring for now, as far as we know and all that stuff. So anyway. That's the ballet. Let's move on to our top six rarities for Sabbath. This is volume five. If you want to see the other four episodes, maybe I'll throw some links down there. We're going to be covering 1973, this one. Guys, those earlier episodes, you know, focused on a lot of bootleg material. But, you know, as far as rarities go for Sabbath, the, the well really runs dry by like 72 and this era. And now we're kind of just really just left with what the band gave us on their deluxe editions. So once again, we're utilizing the Volume 4 Super Deluxe Edition from a few years ago to get unearth some classics out of this Live at Last production and, of course, retitled Live in the UK 1973 in that box set. So let's go over this a little bit because uh, pretty interesting and stuff you may not know so let's just chat it up a minute. This is great. I'm not a fan of dark owls, but this one, it's hoppy, like it says. Really smooth, almost, can't put my finger on that taste there, but that is some good stuff. All right, let's get going. So now when this first came out, 
the Super Deluxe Edition, and you had Live in the UK. I remember driving around with it and just wondering, is are this the same exact songs from, you know, they're real vague about what the hell's on here. They just say Live in the UK. Well, we know Live at Last was recorded from two gigs, March 11th and March 16th of 73. Uh, this one, it just says March 73. So it kind of left you wondering if you were just getting the same exact thing again. Although they did reshuffle the order, which is, you know, a little bit of a hint that something was done. But honestly, I never really looked that much into it back at the time. And uh, I kind of forgot all about it, you know, about checking it out. Whether So I did some research finally. But let's just back up a minute. Originally, we had Live at Last, came out in 1980, Against the Band's Wishes. Um, basically a bootleg for all intents and purposes, since these were live recordings, the band had nothing to do with the production of releasing it. So, I mean, luckily for us, like I said, because this is, you know, you know the band is notorious for going back in the studio and touching everything up as far as live things, at least with Live Evil, Speak of the Devil. So, you know, I'm kind of glad this came out the way it did. Who knows if it would have ever saw the light of day had it not come out the way it came out. So, I mean, I love this album. I had this probably by like, I would say 86 I had this. So I probably only had like three or four Sabbath albums, maybe four or five. But this was, before I had a few of them, I had this guy and I loved it. So we had Live at Last from 1980. We have Past Lives that came out in 2002. It was CD one of that two CD set. Uh, same exact recording except there's if i remember right i don't think there's no there's no band intro in the beginning of it which kind of sucks i love that it's one of my favorite parts volume four of course the live in the uk 73 so there's our three versions of these recordings from march 11th march 16th so basically here's the deal with live in the uk 73. they use three songs that are on here from a different show the opposite show that was used on the version of Live at Last. So that's kind of cool. Like why they didn't use this as a selling point when they put this out is beyond me. You know, I was buying it anyway, regardless. But just would have been cool to know I was getting three new versions of, of these songs, you know. Uh, they also left in the tunings in between songs, stage banner that got omitted on Live at Last. Of course, the Live at Last, a single album. Live in the UK, just the one CD, but it was put on two, if you got the vinyl version, two LPs. All three versions had the same song titles, so no new song, no new songs, but new performances of them, at least, on Live in the UK. Uh, Live at Last and Past Lives used five songs from Manchester, March 11th, four songs from London, March 16th. Live in the UK only uses two songs from the 11th, Manchester, and uses seven songs from London Rainbow Theatre, March 16th. So that's kind of cool. So three unique songs, Tomorrow's Dream, Sweet Leaf, and Snowblind. All right, so that kind of makes them candidates for our top six rarities of 73. Like I said, guys, there's nothing out there in the market, at least soundboard quality-wise, as far as other demos or everything other concerts, nothing. So really soundboard quality stuff, it all comes out of here. You know, luckily we got this, like I said, I, I used to collect these Sabbath rarities years ago. And, you know, this era would just be a big sort of blank space. So now we got all this good stuff. So let's give a little shout out to the Monomania version, number six, Sabbath Bloody Sabbath, of course, we got it on this guy from the, sing the vinyl album out of the vinyl album collection. All mono songs, which is pretty cool. Version on there, nice to have it nice and clean. I actually do have 45 single of it. Before there was Mono Mania, you went out and bought 45s to get everything from Sabbath. Now, mono version here on this side. Opposite side is kind of cool. You know, I haven't looked at this in a while. It's got a date stamped on it. I think I got these from, I think they're from Discogs actually, but January 31st, 1974. So I don't know if this record station, uh, radio station I got this from used to stamp their stuff, but 
released November 2nd, 1973 in the UK. You know, it's just different. So it's kind of interesting. It's only three and a half minutes instead of almost six. So pretty, pretty chunky edit there. Just interesting. All right, let's move on to number five. Let's get to some real material. Snowblind, we're gonna pull that one from Live in the UK. It being different than the version on Past Lives and Live at Last. The song, I never heard a bad version of Snowblind. This is killer. I love that solo. It's just so smooth and, you know, kind of slow as far as I am. He's playing it. It's just such a groove song, groove solo. I can actually play it. It's that slow. It's great. So our alternate comes from London, not Manchester. Number five, Snowblind, live in the UK. Tomorrow's Dream. Now this one, amazing, okay? But I have to go with the Live at Last version. Even though the sound quality is not as good, I just like the intro better. Will you welcome Black Sabbath? It's just the best. So that has to stay in there. I think the other version, Live in the UK, something else, similar but it just doesn't have the same you know punch for me and just a little nod to live at last we're not leaving you in the dust despite the production being a little worse than live in the uk tomorrow's dream is number four okay and let's move right back to live in the uk for song number three you got to have this in there somewhere right killing yourself to live off of this guy like i said versions being the same I'll go with the better sound quality, okay? On Live in the UK. Of course, it's released eight, this is a version eight months before it was officially released on Sabbath Bloody Sabbath. So, a little bit of scat lyrics. There's actually like no chorus in here at all, except Ozzy just screaming, oh yeah, and things like that. You guys know it. Uh, but with the versions being the same, UK quality, we'll go with this one for number three. On to a sip of dark ale again. Man, that's delicious. I'm a fan. Cornucopia. You knew it had to be up there, right? I mean, come on. The song is awesome. And the version on here is awesome. Like, just when you think it can't get any heavier than the album, it almost does live. I'm not even sure if, if it does in fact, but it's great live. We'll go with Live in the UK again with the sound quality being a little better. Since all versions are the same from the same source, just the ultimate in doom metal, man, as you already know. I'm not telling you there's anything new here. Uh, the, this is the only soundboard live version being able to be had of this song. Uh, now, I have to reiterate here, man, despite the band being ripped off with Live at Last, again... I'm just grateful that this thing exists because who knows if this would have even made it onto the super deluxe box set for volume four, right? Guys, you know, when these guys get opposed to something, they're sort of, it's stuck, you know, it's like they can't get past it. So they had no choice but to deal with the fact that this was out there when it came to the box set. So they probably, and even past lives. So, you know, cornucopia just rules. All right, last but not least, you know what it has to be. It's got to be the kick-ass version of Wicked World. Guys, this is the version from Live in the UK, all right? It's an alternate version, and it's seven minutes longer than the version you get on Live at Last or Past Lives, all right? It's the same recording date, though, which is kind of interesting, right? This is uh, March 16th in London. So, which really can only mean that the previous version that we used to get on live at last had been edited down. And I think actually, you know, when I think about it, I always felt like there was one spot in particular where you can, feels like an edit, sounds like an edit, you know? So I guess I was right about that all along. Uh, never took anything away from how awesome the song is, but just we get seven more minutes of it here. It's 19 minutes on live at last. It's 26 minutes on live in the UK. Uh, what a medley, you know, Wicked World, which is great that it's still in the set at this point, and I think it would be gone by the next tour, so it's slower, it's heavier, it's fantastic. Into a guitar solo, followed by some some of Orchid, into some of Into the Void, the Sometimes I'm Happy jam, which of course never made it to an actual record, so just another reason to love this version. Into some Super Knot, 
drum solo and then winding it all back with a little sort of Wicked World. I think they even say reprise on the uh, live in the UK. Do they? Yes, they do. Uh, I don't really consider just kind of winding the song down, but what awesome greatness here. Guys, that's my six favorite, top six Black Sabbath rarities from 1973. Uh, live in the UK, man. I mean, besides being 12 minutes longer than, I mentioned this earlier, but 12 minutes longer than the uh, past lives and live at last versions. Set list, like I said, restored to the original running order or what it usually was on most of the dates of that tour. So that's kind of cool. You know, as many times as I heard Live at Last, when I first heard this, I, I wasn't noticing that, you know, it's just kind of weird. However, this is, you know, another reason to get this album. If you didn't know those things, like I said, I meant to like investigate them back when I bought this. I couldn't find any information about it back when I bought it. Slipped my mind the last few years. Well, there's the deal with it. Three songs from alternate days. Some of the edits that were done to Wicked World, undone for Live in the UK. All right, guys, that's going to do it for the top six. Let's talk about a handful, handful of actual Philadelphia-related, Philly area-related topics to do with Sabbath. Uh, you know, it's my, where I'm originally from. I still live pretty close to there. One comes from a recent soundbite, actually, from Ozzy. Now, I had heard this years ago that... You know, his favorite movie of all time. And I think, I don't know if it was someone else in the band or Ozzy, but somebody said that this was, might have been Ward, saying that uh, the band's favorite horror movie is at least Ozzy for sure. He was recently in the news saying this, but I think Ward said this in the past, was The Exorcist from 1973. What I hadn't heard was that the band saw it in Philadelphia, which was kind of cool. Uh, the movie was released December 26th of 73, and the band played the Philadelphia Spectrum February 9th of 74, so that definitely makes sense that, uh, totally possible, right? Uh, the band hadn't even heard of it. I think uh, one of the roadies told them about it and told them they had to go see it, so kind of a cool little thing, which, uh, you know, in some other Philly-related news, by the way, I just remember, now this goes back to probably the 90s. I think I read this when they came to town on the reunion tour 99, I want to say, that Ozzy always loved coming to Philly, and Sabbath, actually. So it might not have even been Ozzy, but somebody from the band just saying that they really, they missed home big time when they would come over here, back in, especially back in the early days. And Philadelphia just reminded them of Birmingham. Uh, the main highway is I-95, runs right past a bunch of like shipping docks. All a lot of that being changed now or gone now, but very industrial town, as you can imagine. Back in the day, right along the Delaware River there, and the road between the airport and the venues, like the Spectrum, would take you right past a lot of that action. So gone now, but just I thought I'd throw that little tidbit, random memory out there. Which also got me to thinking about this thing that I had heard before, and there was actually a decent article about it online. There's actually several articles online. But the fact that I once read that Philadelphia was the first gig they ever played, which if you dig deeper, it wasn't Philly, but nearby. Now, the band themselves kind of dispute that. They, Iomi and Ozzy specifically wrote, I think, in books that their first U.S. show was in New York, some club called Uganda's or something. This is freaking awesome. Uh, suddenly, I'm a Dark Owl fan. Just like that. See that, man? The magic of Black Sabbath. And I have to look at this, man. Maybe you want another. That looks cool. I like it. Uh, maybe if enough of you is one, and I'll, I'll run some more prints or whatever. Anyway, it was not Philadelphia. The date is... Not disputed. The date is October 30th, 1970, which appropriately, again, what is it with this band? Mischief Night here in America. Ozzy and, like I, like I said, Ozzy and Iomi both stating that it's a New York club. However, a lot of sources, pretty much all the sources I looked up, and I looked up a half dozen of them, have that date being Glassboro State College in New Jersey. Guys, it's only a I think it's 45 minutes or so from, from where I live now. So it's kind of got me thinking if I should maybe make a road trip there and do a little 
little vlog about it. You know, it'd be cool. The, the gymnasium they played still stands. So there's a lot of confusion between what happened, you know, the whole blackout thing where the European plugs didn't work with the American electrical system, what have you. And that's part of Iomi and Ozzy's recollection, but they place it in New York, but apparently you can find articles about the campus being thrown into a blackout by Black Sabbath. So, you know, I don't think Glassboro State College would be making that story up, you know, or the local newspaper. So I tend to think that their first show is at this little Glassboro State College, which is now called Rowan University. I think I'm going to take a trip up there at some point, guys, and just take some pictures and some footage for you. I think that might be cool. I mean, I don't know if you guys are interested or not. I'm interested in it. So anyway, here is a flyer for the for that Glassboro State show, and it says right on there, October 30th, you know, so why does it look like a cartoon? Apparently the event organizer had his daughter draw it up. That's the story. This flyer went to auction in 2007. I think it sold for like 500 bucks. So anyway, whichever story you believe, I just thought that was kind of interesting. Now, these are just the random thoughts that go through my head during a typical Black Sabbath month for me. Those last three things, Exorcist and so forth, all just random things. Guys, finally, I mean, this isn't the end of the show. I still got more to talk about after that. But Ozzy Osbourne, Bark at the Moon Outtakes. I told you I finally picked up my first real version. Uh, I had it downloaded off the internet. I'm going to be given that downloaded. Not downloaded, I actually bought it off iOffer. So somebody basically bootlegged this bootleg. So this is killer. Here's the full review for it, guys. As promised, but pre-recorded. This is a great one. Ozzy Osbourne, Bark at the Moon Outtakes. It's on the Cannonball label. Two silver press CDs on this guy. I'm not sure why this isn't more popular. Can't find it online. That's how I originally found it 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, sounds like the final rehearsals right before they recorded the album to me. Vocals, good. Not great, but not bad. Uh, there is another title called Bark at the Moon Demos. He's a little, Ozzy's a little rough on that one. This one, not too bad though. Interesting to me for what's like not on here as opposed to what is here. And we'll get into that in a second. Very good, excellent, as you can imagine, stereo soundboard, quality sound. Just without that final, you know, production polish on there. I just love, as you already have heard me say many times, love hearing bands do demos and rehearsals. It's just like alternate versions of, of an album I already know and love. Uh, let's take a look at the packaging real quick. You get a, they're a little minimal with Cannonball. At least they're silver press CDs. This inner tray card shot, or a couple shots. Discs themselves. Again, pretty minimal. BATM outtakes, right? Uh, discs one, disc two looks the same, although <clears throat> just a different color, orange there. Back behind disc two, nice shot of Jake. And I already showed you the back cover. If I haven't, let's throw it up there again. There are your titles. Got most, if not all, the album there, even one of the bonus tracks, which was originally on the UK version. So, start talking about this bad boy. So what's cool about it, like I said, is, you know, the, I'm not like a Bark of the Moon maniac. I think it's a really good album, not, excellent but does have its share of good songs some of which i loved right away back in the day others took a little time to grow on me others i still think suck but um i don't think there's any suck material on here We're actually got some good stuff they left the one or two i don't really like not even on here so bark at the moon first version uh take one all but complete there's no uh he doesn't do that echoed laugh in there you know and what's co cool about this one, the end, the end solo, instead of that little ride out on the notes that, that Jake does, Jake plays, it's done on keyboards, you know, instead of guitar. So you might think that's, I mean, I love that guitar riff that makes, helps make that song so awesome. Uh, but I, it's kind of cool hearing something different. You know, I have that version on the record. So hearing the keyboards do it kind of makes you wonder, like, did, did Don Airy write that part, you know? 
But that's really cool and it's a good alternate take of Bark of the Moon. The second version of Bark of the Moon is also a favorite of mine because there's no guitar intro to it at all. Uh, you just hear the rhythm come in with the bump bump. And then there's no guitar playing at all again till the next bump bump. So it just starts with just rhythm. But then once the song starts, the guitar is in there. So it is the full band other than that intro, just bass and drums and keys, I guess. Uh, you can hear the backing keyboard better during the song too. So the first half of the guitar solo is missing uh, for whatever reason. So you just hear, so it's really get to hear the keyboard again nice and clear, usually buried under the rhythm guitar that was overdubbed on the album. So getting to hear the keyboards really nice and clear there. And then the second half of the solo is in there though. So, and then again, the end riff of the song is done on keyboards instead of guitars. So just kind of interesting stuff here. You're no different. This is one that uh, grew on me and I really love that song now. Guitar kind of higher in the mix. And in this case, kind of the other way around, the, you can hear the guitar doing all kinds of, with like a chorusy wah wah effect, doing all kinds of different things at the chorus part. And, you know, on the album, I think they used keyboards for those parts. Or if the guitar was in there doing this, it was below level wise underneath the keyboard. So hearing that clearly is really cool. So less keyboards on your note, different, more guitar, albeit rhythm guitar, but really interesting, tasty stuff there. Rock and Roll Rebel intro is with the full band instead of just guitar. So that's kind of cool on version number one. Um, there's no vocals though. So this is an instrumental version, uh, but it's really cool. And what I, you know, it's really, what makes it cool is that you at least get a full version next of Rock and Roll Rebel with vocals. So, you know, like on the Master of Reality box set or deluxe edition, how you got After Forever instrumental. That's cool. But it's really what makes it cool is that you get a full version with vocals too. So I like, you know, if you're going to give me an instrumental version, then, you know, give me one with vocals too. And that's what we get here. So the next version um, does have the guitar only intro, like, like the album does. A little bit more like scat vocals though with this song, uh, but the melody intact. And, you know, listen, we got to give Ozzy some credit. He might not really play instruments, you know, or play them well. He can write himself vocal melodies and that's such an important that's a one of the most important version uh, aspects of songs to me and he's a master at it and you know so that's intact here even with scat lyrics center of eternity i think it's called forever in the uk center of eternity video here it says take one but it's you know the only version on this disc uh really cool no keyboards it's guitar only so it's heavier and the guitar even fills in some of those small keyboard parts. So guitar heavy version here. So if you're a Jake E. Lee fan, you gotta hear this version of Center of Eternity. You know, awesome. Look for outtakes on YouTube. You probably just find that one song. It's great. And I'm not the biggest fan of this song. You know, it was one of the original three I liked a lot back in the day, because it was just because it was heavy and fast. Over time, I realized that it wasn't a whole lot to it and it wasn't that into it. But this version has me back into it again. A little less keyboard and more guitar. You also get So Tired. It's okay, it's better than just hearing a regular studio version, but not any different or really any better. Um, Waiting for Darkness is cool. Vocals are rough on that one, but I love that song. Spiders sounds like the same version used as the bonus. I don't hear any difference in anything with that one. Disc two, 10 versions of Now You See It, Now You Don't. Uh, overall, pretty much the same. A few of them have alternate beginnings, which is kind of cool. When I make my mixtapes of uh, or playlists on my iPod of Sabbath alternates, and once we get up to the '80s, I'm using Ozzy stuff in there too. Every other song's Ozzy. Uh, I use a couple of these on there, or one of them rather, uh, just because of the alternate beginning. But uh, that's really the only difference to the song. That's really the only way to make this song any different was to just mess with the intro. So they do that here a couple times. Disc two, not a big deal. Overall, though, disc one's awesome and well worth it. All right, guys, toast to that awesome review. Up next, guys, I thought I would just show you some random Black Sabbath-related titles. 
First one being really interesting. I'll give you a little background on it because it's not your run-of-the-mill Sabbath-related stuff. Okay, you got to know your, you got to know your history here a little bit. Very recently, I picked up like a maybe half dozen titles off of somebody. You know, selling a whole lot of different CDs. I still do that now and then. You know, kind of eased up, but got six titles from them. Now, in a separate listing by the same seller, which I always do that, man. Always check sellers' other listings because then you're combining shipping. Basically, get free shipping on some things. He had this guy listed separately for 10 bucks, which is kind of a steal. The Norman Haynes Band, Den of Iniquity. If you're not familiar, I'm going to give you a little history here, but show you real quick what I'm looking at is Esoteric Recordings or Esoteric Records version. I think this came out, let's hope there's a year on here. It just has 71, 2011 version. It's got six bonus tracks, so it's kind of cool. I think there's three versions out there all together of this bad boy. So let's go over a little bit of this. And yeah, I'm looking on my notes because it gets a little twisty turny with this history of these guys. He was a member of Locomotive, who was also, that band had, I think Jim Simpson, the first manager of Sabbath, might have been in Locomotive. I think he was definitely their manager, even after he left Locomotive. Norman Haynes was a member of Locomotive. Uh, this is, a, like I said, a 1971 album put out by the Norman Haynes Band. I'll work these up to how he got solo out of Locomotive in a second. But this was a 40th anniversary edition, by the way. Uh, there's a nice long book in here, which I haven't read yet. I'm looking forward to checking it out one day. But this is a real great pickup for 10 bucks. guess is what I'm getting at. So... Um, I haven't heard it yet, all right? I've only heard one song off it, and we'll get to that in a second. So, Locomotive was sort of this jazz-tinged psych band, you know, late 60s. Haynes wrote most of, if not all, of Locomotive's only album they were going to release. He was also a songwriter where other artists used his songs. Uh, sang, Norman Haynes sang, and played piano and organ too. Uh, but mainly, chiefly, I think the songwriter, but also their piano player. He, Norman Haynes turned down an offer by Jim Simpson to join Black Sabbath. You remember that whole story where they were a six-piece for a couple minutes? I think they had a, uh, was Jim Simpson the sax player? or They had a brass player in there at some point. I'm a little foggy on this. I haven't looked up, brushed it up on it. But uh, he did play piano. Norman Haynes was the piano player on the 1969 demo of The Rebel. He possibly wrote it. That's unclear, but at least he's the piano player on that song for sure. The other definitive thing about Norman Haynes and his relationship to Sabbath is that he definitely wrote When I Came Down, their second song they ever recorded. We're talking September-ish, 1969, okay? Wrote to be a single to, for Jim Simpson to shop the band around to get gigs. Um, Norman, Haynes, Norman Haynes left Locomotive in 1970 and did Den of Iniquity at Abbey Road Studios, believe it or not, in 1971. Uh, so what's cool about this, ver this album, guys, you get his version of When I Came Down. He calls it When I Come Down. So, you know. The version of When I Came Down that's out there by Black Sabbath was actually pieced together by fans somehow extracting the audio off of the Black Sabbath story video where they talk about it and it's just in the background. They're not, actually, they're not talking about the song. They're just talking about the old days. In the background playing is, is 30 seconds of When I Came Down. Somehow people were able to extract the 30 seconds and just loop it four times to get a two-minute version. So here you get probably was the full-on version of the song, not looped and pieced together, obviously. Full-on thing. Just with one I come down as the title. It's organ heavy, you know, but it's still a really cool song. Sabbaths I like better, but this is really good too. So just thought I would throw this your way, guys. I look forward to checking it out. By the way, Norman Haynes passed away uh, June 22nd, 2021. So coming up on two years that he's left us. So how about a cheers to original Sabbath writer, Norman Haynes, at the very least, right? A couple more titles to show you real quick. I only heard three songs from this so far. Black Sa or 
Geezer Butler's Black Science. I think this is a 1997 album, so right before the uh, reunion, 97 TVT Records. I think I've seen this before. You got cool little fold out, a nice little cover action going on there. That's cool. Uh, it's pretty good. I'm not sure I love the singing, but it's not bad. But the songs are good. Um, like I said, I'm only three songs into 13 songs. So can't wait to check this out. If any of you have this, let me know what you think. That would be cool. Um, another title I recently got. Haven't had a chance to listen to it yet. It's still wrapped up. But Ozzy Osbourne, Bark at the Moon, Rough Mix. I get these two mixed up all the time. This is not the outtakes I already showed you. That That's... The review we just looked, uh, listened to and watched, that's that guy. This one, same label, Cannonball. These are, just as you would think, rough mixes, and they are rougher than those outtakes. Uh, musically sounds great. Ozzy's just sort of phoning it in a little bit with these. But, you know, if it's soundboard and it's Ozzy or Sabbath-related, Ozzy pre-85, I'm in. I'm on board. So... Another one that I had, I think I had this one. You know what? I thought I had this one downloaded. I didn't. So this is actually, I used to. I don't know what happened to it. So it wasn't in my iTunes the other day when I checked. So cool to have this one. Haven't even on, opened it yet, like I said. I'm sure it sounds the same. And last but not least, guys, Black Sabbath, Geezer Butler, recently weighed in on what his least favorite Black Sabbath album is. Now, this was only a few weeks ago. No surprise, of course, as always, it's this shitty album called Never Say Die. This album sucks, man. I mean, just listen to the band themselves. It's it's awful, you know. As usual, there are no specifics at all, you know, just generalizations regarding the era. I'm just bullshitting around. Love this album. This is, this is my favorite album by Black Sabbath. Now, it was the first album I ever owned, which does not make it my favorite, okay? Uh, I used to only listen to side one for years, like decades. And then maybe about 15 years ago, heard a bootleg of Shockwave, it got me to spin the whole thing. I mean, I listened to it a few times, but I used to only mainly listen to side one. It's my favorite Sabbath album for the last dozen, maybe 15 years. I mean, throw that friggin' breakout bullshit off of this album that would be perfect. Oh, actually, Classic Rock and Metal Review has an update on Geezer's comments. They're wrong. All right, there you go. Guys, I'm going to leave links for those drinks, cock Black Sabbath cocktail recipes. How cool is that? I don't know what you thought of this episode. I friggin' loved it. Great beer. Great episode. Great glass, by the way. I mean, I don't know what you think of that, but holds a beer, you know. All right, guys, that's going to do it for this one. If you can like and subscribe, that'd be awesome. Hopefully you're in the Sabbath enough to have stuck around to the bitter end here or the not-so-bitter end. This is delicious. I'll catch you all next time.